Uh, well, first of all, Simi, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, the first thing I want to ask you is really about uh, the act of remembering. and Because one thing I learned after my father died um, from my beloved chosen family, Sammy Ablaza Wills, who they lost their mom at almost the exact same time that I lost my father, is that one of the best metabolizers for grief is actually just remembering. Um, yeah. And in that spirit... Um, what is a story that you have to tell about your father, perhaps especially one that's about a detail that is sort of minute but deeply meaningful for you? Yeah, you know, um, so my, my father, uh, I just describe him for a moment. He's, he's very elegant, very subtle. He was a poet, scholar, educator, activist, um, incredible orator, charming and witty. And, and he looked like... Um, I know those paintings of Chinese scholars. That's that's how I think of him, you know. Um, and especially as he aged, he really grew into that that delicacy. Um, like he was he was like a bit of brushwork. My father really, really, and um, had this beautiful, full, feathery, wispy hair that was dark black and then uh, peppered and then luminous silver like a nimbus like a halo and he just exuded light um so there was a place in the living room that i consider his power corner when you walked into our living room and two sofas would meet and he would sit at the corner where the two sofas meet he had a coffee table he had a lamp it was always piled high with books and he'd have his chai and he'd sit there and read and he'd be writing in his beautiful notebooks um, and I'd walk into the house and I would see him there. And, um, so what I recall is the expression he would have when I walked into the house. And sometimes when I'd come in, he would stand, like he would rise to greet me. And, um, it was so moving to me because at some point, I heard this tradition, hadith of the Prophet, may peace be upon him. And uh, Prophet Muhammad was very close to his daughter, Fatima. They were soulmates. They were uh, very close. And there's a hadith that says that whenever she would enter the room, he would rise to greet her. Now, I come from South Asia. And in South Asian tradition, we have deep filial piety. Um, you might have seen in Bollywood films um, where people enter a room and they touch their parents' feet mm -hmm. as an act of, of respect. It's a beautiful gesture. Um, in our milieu, in a Muslim milieu, often we go to elders, we bow our head, and they, they place their hands on our head in blessing. Um, but there's this tradition that the Prophet ﷺ would actually rise. He himself would rise when his daughter would enter the room. This was his, his young daughter. And, and I realized that often my father would get up from that couch and rise to greet me. But more often, I mean, on every occasion, it's like something within him rose up. Like I'd enter the room and I would feel his spirit rise to greet me. I would feel like his, his being rising up to greet me and of course it would emerge in a smile or a greeting or something in the eyes um and and there was a vulnerability in it too because he had a very hard childhood he lost his mother when he was very young and um had a lot of exile a lot of rejection in his childhood as well as a lot of that chosen family kind of love um so I think what I do in his memory is I try to rise like that mm. for everyone I meet because everybody is um, someone's child, you know, mm -hmm. there's a child within everyone um, in some way, uh, you know, Muhammad for us is uh, the figure, he's like the representative of a kind of light and we're all children of that light. It's like the light of humanity. So um, that's been a really powerful act of remembering for me. Mm. 
either to rise in person or to rise in spirit. Yeah. When I yeah. encounter people. And to remember Thank when I'm down that he, he did that for me. That's that's who I am. I'm I'm the mm -hmm. one for whom this beautiful man would rise, for whom his being would rise. So mm. when I uh when I'm struggling or I feel, you know, sad or bad about myself or I'm berating myself as we all do, um, this is a bomb. Oh, that's so tender. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. You're welcome. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share this. Yeah, yeah. I feel like it's those little things that are really so critical to remembering that it's, it is like that small gest it's in the gesture it's in the like sort of like i don't know those like moments of intimacy that are not they're not like for everyone usually but yeah um yeah we carry them deep within us um i guess maybe to get a little uh conceptual about it is uh could you talk a little bit more about what this kind of remembering does for you both personally as you're sort of moving through your life but also like in uh in your activism in um community um and how how is remembering through grief supportive for you you know i think that my um father uh, is a model for me uh because uh well, first of all, he lived through so many kinds of grief. Um, mm. You know, his own family was torn apart, uh, literally, because his great-grandfather was resisting uh, British imperialism in India and was exiled. Um, he was condemned to hang and had to leave India, uh, left my great-grandmother and my grandfather and uh, uh, his siblings, and he went and lived with the Azad Qabail, the free tribes in Afghanistan, actually. Um, so my father was raised by a father who was in that sense orphaned of his father. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's a lot of heroism and we tell the story of these like, um, you know, noble decolonial um, ancestors who were fighting and... Um, but at the same time, there's there's the trauma there, and that's that's the vulnerability that I witnessed in my father. Like he he would rise, but it was always there was always something. There's always a question about how he would be received. Uh, it was so endearing. It it um, evoked such tenderness in me. Um, but he was a freedom fighter and the son of freedom fighters, um, not just the men, the women. And um, I remember that when I despair, um, what we're witnessing, the genocide in Gaza is shattering to the soul. It's devastating. Um, and my father was exceptionally generous. The amount of charity that he gave, the ways in which he gave it, we, to thousands of people that he educated, uplifted, fed, nourished. And he was never a man who had a lot. He was a scholar. He was a student. And then, you know, he was a junior prof with five children. And But um, so when I'm in grief, I really, I just, I try to turn around and give. Mm -hmm. That's what I do. Every time it feels overwhelming, I've thought like, can I help one person have a meal? Can I help somebody to get a tent? Can I help somebody, uh, you know, recently, Gazans were needing to leave Rafa for supposedly safer zones. Well, transport for a family out of Rafa is about $400. And if you're sitting in Rafa and you've been told to leave because flyers are falling, where do you come up with about $400? Um, so, you know, I mean, my father really taught me this Muslim principle. If you save one life, it's as if you've saved humanity. And if you kill one soul, it's as if you've killed all humanity. And um, so my goal has been to try to save one life, one more life, um, in whatever way I can. Um, and he was always um, 
ready with a willing ear to support people and to listen. I have one of my best friends in high school. He calls her the night wanderer. After she would leave the public library, uh, you know, at like 11.30 p.m. in high school, she would come to my house and she'd sit in the living room with my dad. I'm an early bird. I'm a morning person. I wake with the birds <laughs> with my mom, fudge a prayer, dawn prayer. But they would be up. He's like, oh, my night wanderer was with me last night. And, you know, and she would just talk to him. And, they, and this, so this is the kind of person he was. Um, so that's what I strive to do. Mm -hmm. To be a listening ear, to be a caring heart, to be a harbor. Um, I can't say that I'm one one hundredth of what he was in that respect. Um, and but uh, but he inspires me to do the best that I can with my capacities. Mm. I really, I really love. I, I, I gotta say, I really love it when I hear about people's parents who have friendships with their friends. Yes. Like, there's there's something about that particular parent to me that is like, they, there's, there's, it says there's something very specific about their character, right? That it's like, it's not just like, here are these kids who are just running around whatever, but it's like, I don't know, an adult who takes an interest in their kids' friends like that, I feel like is such a like uh it's it's taking it's taking the role of of teaching and mentorship so seriously. My mom was like that too. Yeah. That she was she oh. was very like she was always asking me about what my friends were doing. She wanted them to come over, she wanted to have dinner with them and ask them about their interests. And it was like she was also an educator and like they're so that like and she remembered them too like as i went away to college whatever like yeah. she would ask me about them and i i just think that uh and like ask if they wanted to come over when i was home for the holidays and stuff like that i just think that like there's something um very just like gentle and conscientious about an adult who takes interest in their kids friends like that i bet i bet she gave you a gift because and you're grieving, then your friends understand. They can be yeah. with you in it because they're connected to her. I mean, they yeah. must be connected to her as she was connected to them. So it makes yeah. you less alone. They it, carry it was, the memory. It was really like, um, af actually, after both of my parents died, I was surprised at how many of my friends from, even friends I hadn't spoken with in a long time, came back to me and were like, ah, I remember you know, your dad helping out with our, um, uh, it's like extracurricular physics Olympiad team and like how excited he got about the projects that we were doing together. And, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, that, that, uh, involvement in my, my like social and intellectual life, I think, yeah, you're right. It's like, it's a, it really helped me through that time in a way that I think and and taught me about community, right? Without me even really knowing about it, that like there's a way in which you just show up to like these everyday things with like mm -hmm. the genuine excitement you have for other people and for ideas and, and whatever it might be that like you don't know what seeds you're planting when you're doing that. But someday somebody, maybe not even you, somebody will reap that reward. So. Yeah, no. He, one, one story um, that really sticks out for me is that I, I was with him in India and I would travel. I had the pleasure of traveling with him in India several times. But so we were in India and we were in one of a series of little villages where he comes from. And um, we were walking and then this woman came like running out. She, she must have been in her 40s, in her 50s, something like that. And she started talking to him and she was so excited. And um, she said, I heard someone said that you were here. Um, and we would go to each village for like maybe three hours and then go on to the next one. We wouldn't, there was no time, right? But um, she said, I heard, I heard you were here. Someone said they saw you at the mosque and I came running to find you. So this woman, like, 20 years before had ended up being widowed and she had children and she had no money. Uh, she wasn't a relative, but she came from this village that he was from. 
And she wrote to him somehow and told him this and said, you know, if you could send me money for a sewing machine, I know how to sew and I could uh, raise my children from that income. And at the time, he was a graduate student with five children supporting uh, his brother, my mom's brother, and my mom's sister, all of whom uh -huh. they had sponsored to come. <laughs> so, And he was sending money to his own parents and immediate family. And somehow he got the money for a sewing machine and sent that to this wow. woman. So she, she wanted to find him and say that I became a seamstress and I, with dignity, was able to earn a living and like raise and educate and feed my children and they're doing okay now. And um, she went running through the streets to, you know, to tell him <laughs> this, right? And of course he had forgotten that this had even happened. Sure. You know, but literally there's tens of thousands of stories like this mm. with him. It was so, you know, so this, um, yeah, it, it just keeps me humble and it, and it keeps me um, striving. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is going off script a little bit, but, uh, that made me think also, so when I was in college, I got to travel. My dad, uh, grew up in Hong Kong and, um, uh, he was born in mainland China before the communist revolution. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, we, like our family has like really long sort of recorded history. Um, but I got to travel with him a little bit in China um, when I was in my early twenties, um, <laughs> just like that story made me think of just like all the like quirky little things were like going to a place where, uh, you know, I've, I never, I've never lived in Hong Kong or in China and, um, just like traveling with him and like, even the, the sort of like him remembering because he smelled something you know, that was, like, familiar, and, like, telling me a weird little story about, like, him being young, and, like, uh, or, like, the, he was in Hong Kong when I flew out, and the night that I arrived, he picked me up at the airport, and we went to just, like, the little, like, basically diner, um, near my aunt and uncle's apartment, and he ordered for me, because he was like, you have to eat this. Yeah. You know, he was like, this is, this is my comfort food and you have to eat it. <laughs> but just that experience of like traveling with your parents when you grew up in diaspora is like, yeah. so, ah, there's something so special about that. Are there any, are there any other things sort of like that, that, um, uh, from, from traveling with him in India that you can think of? Well, you know, one of the most amazing experiences I had with him was that we have family in Afghanistan because of that great grandfather who went yeah. to exile there. Um, in order to actually receive exile, he married a woman there as well. Um, and so I had two great grandmothers, the one in India um, and the one who was there. And, um, and I have a whole Afghan branch of my family. And when the Russians invaded, they had to leave right away because mm -hmm. this is a family, they're a family of scholars um, and, and activists. And so they left right away and uh, left their beautiful gardens and homes and work and were living in refugee camps um, in Peshawar. And my dad took me, like he took me to Peshawar and we stayed and we lived with them um, where they were living you know, with one room with mattresses all around and all of us sleeping on these mattresses. Um, and what really struck me, like the dignity and just the tenderness of these men, the tenderness of my uncles, like just the way they would put their hand on my shoulder or look at me um, in Persian we use the epithet John, which is like life or breath or soul. What's amazing about it is that it cuts across all barriers of class, of age, of gender, of status. So it is always respectful to call you, for example, you know, Caden John. And it doesn't matter what is your gender, what is your age. So they would call me, see me John, and I could call them, you know, also you know, Inayat John, or sometimes Ammo John, Uncle John, but the tenderness in it um, and the strength and also vulnerability uh, 
it was an amplification of him. It was like seeing him replicated in so many uh, different forms. And, um, and they said often, you know, that when they had their big houses and their gardens, you know, of course, family would come to visit and stay. And it was, but now that they were in this situation, it's my father. It's my father who honored them the same way. He's mm. still coming to be with them and, and spend time with them and, and even more, to love them even more. So, yeah, that was a really powerful um, experience. When I would be with him, he would, um, you know, he'd go visit the barber that he was friends with from childhood and sit, like, on the floor of their shop. And India is a very class-based, it's a, you know, class Cast class, this is really important. And um, mm -hmm. so they were ostensibly from different worlds, but he would just go sit there in his shop and spend hours with him. And then in the same city, Bombay, he would go and take me to other homes where um, someone, you know, a friend of his has, a, they have a garage with uh, 50 antique cars. And when you sit at dinner, there's people who actually walk around the dinner table with the platters. So you just stop them at any point. So um, he was, and he just gave the same love and respect and time to everybody. So traveling with him was quite extraordinary. Yeah, that sounds yeah. amazing. Um, I don't know, I, I, I also feel like the thinking about being in diaspora and homecoming is feels also very tender around what we're seeing unfold in Palestine right now. Um, and I'm curious about how grief has shifted during this time when we've watched this like real time live stream genocide unfold in Gaza and what grief has sort of been able to unlock for you as you've engaged in this political moment. Uh, that's a, a really um, profound and, and complex question. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Um, so in some ways, my experience has been atypical because um, I had an accident on October 7th and I sustained um, some burns and a fracture, but quite a severe concussion. So. I've been on medical leave, and I was not able to be present at protests. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of our processing is like through this physical act of being at a protest, being in like company, um, being in a place that mirrors your grief, your outrage, um, your aspiration to try to bring some water to this fire if it's one drop that you're bringing with your voice. Um, so it was very hard. I was really isolated. I was at home a lot of the time. And um, I had to really, um, and I couldn't even be in Zooms because my screen time was limited right. to 20 minutes a day, really. Yeah. So um, my father um, has a PhD in comparative religion. And uh, when we were growing up, we lived at the Center for the Study of World Religions at Harvard. Um, and we were surrounded by. Hindus, Christians, Buddhists, Jews, Muslims, um, who live in that center and study and are doing their PhDs, but are also practitioners. And we shared um, all our celebrations and holidays. Um, so this is a legacy he gave to me from my earliest days. When we moved there, I was about three, two and a half, maybe. That's where my memory begins, at that place, mm. the, like at the door. Um, that 1970s red door to our apartment. And when you opened it, the furniture was orange and blue, right? <laughs> so it was, it was that, it was a particular moment. And um, so the, the way that I have dealt with my grief is by being part of a coalition of um, Jews and Muslims who have been supporting initially 12 and now about 20 families in Gaza, um, sending money to them directly for food, for tents, for um, medicine, just for the basic things that they need, but also being personally in touch with them and offering emotional support. So there are, there are two people 
out of those 12 um, that I have personal connections with uh, long before October 7th, but it's intensified since October 7th because the need is intensified. Mm -hmm. um, and really, every time the grief overwhelms me, I try either to reach into what I have and also to reach out to people I know and say, look, um, can we put one more week of meals on the table for people? Could you help with the money to rent, to get, uh, to rent a truck, to get them from this zone to this other zone, which is not safe, but which may be safer. Um, but it's also, you know, the, my processing of the Greek must have just been in the WhatsApp groups where I'm talking with the people that we're, because uh, we collaborate, we work together. Oh, have you sent money to this person? That person said they need something. Trying to take care of everyone, but our conversations with each other, because um, our grief then is it's grounded in like real information we're getting in Facebook Messenger all the time, and the sharing of this real information, mm -hmm. and the attempt to come up with whatever solutions we can, um, and we share that kind of structural understanding of uh, the the causes you know of this, but it's. It's very nitty gritty, and I think that helps. Yeah, and it it gives me hope because we're modeling. You know, it's not just that we're helping, but we're modeling the world that can be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm a lot better now, and I hope to be able to be in the encampments for the you know Shabbats and the Friday prayers. Um, yeah, and to bring some of my own um, experience. Um, as a Sufi teacher engaged in kinds of healing practices and ceremony into those spaces. Um, and also to now be able to come into the protests. Yeah. Yeah. And that's great. Be with people. I think we need to be <sighs> with people. It's yeah. It's so critical to be with people right now. Um, and I also hope uh, your concussion symptoms continue to yeah, get better. Cause they're, they're a lot better. <laughs> that's why I'm able to do this. So I'm, <laughs> I'm grateful. I mean, that was, um, you know, I was, in some ways, I mean, I was processing the grief through my body. It happened October 7th. So October 7th, yeah. I got this huge cast um, and I had chemical burns here and I had a concussion. So it was so, uh, but I was receiving the most nuanced, tender, subtle care, you know, from people laying hands on me or mm -hmm. putting acupuncture needles in me, you know, um, in beautiful rooms with a salt lamp. You know, with the salt lamp glow, and um, and of course the hospitals, the doctors, and I'm in Canada, so it's all just this is all available to me from the government, and I have excellent extended health through the university. I mean, at, at every moment, I was just thinking about how um, those children under the rubble have the same subtle, delicate neural pathways as I do. They yeah. merit the same care. Someone saying, let me put like these delicate needles in you and let your chi flow the way it, it needs to and allow you to heal in this safe space. Um, yeah. So I felt very connected through my embodiment and in the recognition of the vast difference between what I was receiving, which was everything I needed. Yeah. Um, and, and what they are, are not receiving. Yeah. Yeah. I had a, in November of last year, I had a, a major medical procedure and I, I had a lot of those same thoughts that like mm -hmm. getting in the surgery prep room, you know, having a nurse bring me ice water Yes, because to like take the, the like anti-nausea pills, you know, um, just like the sort of like that sweet care from strangers Yeah, that is really kind of what binds us together as a society and how not available that is and that everybody deserves that level of, of tenderness and care yes yeah yeah no it's um uh, my my uh, practitioners kept saying after a condition your entire job is to calm your nervous system and <laughs> i'd say mm -hmm. this is so hard to do right now that is it, you know this is how do I calm my nervous system? Yeah, this is like, yeah. um, um, and it takes a lot of discipline not to fall into 
just doom scrolling, just receiving, you know, uh, and, and not then also doing the work, which is the sharing or the writing your representative or showing up, taking meaningful mm -hmm. political action, taking meaningful humanitarian action, you know. Um, so, so I do try to, the, um, I'm involved in the path of um, dervishi and turning. And that symbol of the dervish is that the, the right arm is raised and it's receiving, and then the left arm is lowered, offering. And uh, when you're in pain, that's what you're supposed to do. Just receive, receive and be a channel. Channel through your heart, filter through the heart and offer. And keep moving, keep turning keep turning and offering right and um so sometimes when i don't know what to do i'll just i'll do that practice symbolically and allow that then to take me um you know as a way of regulating and then take me into some other action you know whether yeah. it's the letter you write whether it's that's super super beautiful thank you so much Simi. you're welcome you're welcome thank you so much for sharing the memories of your father with us, Simi John. As I know your voice to be so, such a beautiful voice, I knew that I wanted to ask you to bless us with a recitation. Um, I want to ask you to perform um, Rafat Olivier's final poem, If I Must Die. Like your father, Rafat Olivier was a poet and a professor from Gaza. One of the reasons that I asked you to speak about your father is that loving him and remembering him is in itself an act of radical resistance. The memories of the love of our gentle, tender men are themselves a threat to white supremacy, colonialism, and authoritarian mm -hmm. fascism because our opponents want to portray our men as violent and therefore deserving of violence, as full of hatred and therefore deserving of hatred and death and extermination. So it is in it of itself an act of resistance to remember the truth about the tenderness of our men, of our sons, of our brothers, of our fathers, of our cousins, of our grandfathers. And our opponents know this. Olivier was deliberately targeted. For the Euromed monitor, the apartment that he was in with his family was, quote, surgically bombed out of the entire building where it's located, according to corroborated eyewitness and family accounts, which came after weeks of death threats that Olivier received online and by phone from Israeli accounts. In his last interview before being killed, with the sound of Israeli bombs exploding in the background, Olivier said, quote, I am an academic. Probably the toughest thing I have at home is an expo marker. But if the Israelis invade, if they barge at us, charge at us, open door to door to massacre us, I'm going to use that marker to throw it at the Israeli soldiers, even if it is the last thing that I would be able to do. And this is the feeling of everyone. We are helpless. We have nothing to lose. On the 26th of April, 2024, five months after Israel Israeli bombs surgically killed Alarir and his family members. His eldest daughter, Shaima, her husband, Mohammed Siam, and their newborn baby were killed by an Israeli airstrike on their home in Gaza City. Shaima had written to her father, Rafat, in a message after she delivered her baby a few months after her father was killed. I have a beautiful news for you. I wish I could convey it to you while you are in front of me. I present to you your first grandchild. Do you know, my father, that you have become a grandfather? This is your grandson, Abdul Rahman, who I have long imagined you carrying, but I never imagined that I would lose you early even before you see him. So I wanted to ask you, see me, John, if you would grace us with Rafat Alarir's final poem.
if I must die, you must live to tell my story. To sell my things, to buy a piece of cloth and some strings. Make it white with a long tail so that a child somewhere in Gaza, while looking heaven in the eye, awaiting his dad, who left in a blaze, and bid no one farewell, not even to his flesh, not even to himself. Seize the kite, my kite you made, flying up above, and thinks for a moment an angel is there bringing back love. If I must die, let it bring hope. Let it be a story. Let their memories rise in justice.